as Allison so kindly introduced, my name is Ashley Salima. I am the State Archivist and Public Records Administrator for Rhode Island, and I get to have the absolute pleasure and joy and excitement of being surrounded by these historic records all day, every day, in one way or another. So thank you for joining us. Um, I have a quick word of welcome I'm gonna advance to from Secretary of State Nellie Corbea. Um, she actually oversees the Office of the State Archives in Rhode Island and she also loves and is engaged in, in the history and civic engagement of our state. So I'm gonna play this for you right now. Hi, I'm Secretary of State Nellie Corbea and I'm here to welcome you to our new virtual programs at the Rhode Island State Archives. Right now, the archives is currently open on a limited appointment only basis, but my team and I have created a new series of virtual programs to continue to share our more than 10 million remarkable records with you. We hope you enjoy this program from home or wherever you are, and that you'll take this as an opportunity to explore our collection from family history to voting and much, much more. If you have any questions, please contact us so our team can help you with your research. Have fun, and I hope to see you in the State Archives one day soon. So I also hope that one day we'll get to see you in the State Archives, but it is wonderfully exciting to see so many different places pop up in the cities and towns where you are all from. So thank you again for, for joining us. We are excited to get to tell you about little old Rhode Island uh, and what we have. So a little bit about the State Archives itself. We are, as I said, part of the Department of State overseen by Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea, but we are one of the most public facing divisions within the department. So we're part of the Division of Archives, Library and Public Information, and we're responsible for preserving and making available Rhode Island's historic public records all the way back to 1638. We also oversee records management and assistance for executive branch agencies, which also helps us preserve those records of permanent value on that avenue as well. So discovering your story at the State Archives, the chances are if any members of your family lived in Rhode Island at any time between the mid 18th and mid 20th centuries, will have some record of their existence in one way or another. We have limited resources back to the colonial times and then more and more as time goes on, which I'm sure would not be a surprise to any of you logging in today. But we're excited to get to tell you a little bit about the collection and about us. And this is my favorite part before I turn it over. Um, I get to tell you about the big picture of what we have. So before I turn it over to Rich and he dives deep into the genealogy specific, I get to tell you about the historic records that go all the way back to the general recorder, which is when the archives was officially established. So we've been overseeing these records and keeping them safe for over 300 years. And since then we've adapted to all the different changes in technology and how to do our services best to meet really your needs and the needs of, of anybody that comes in. And especially throughout 2020, one of our biggest pushes has been to digitize more and more material for that remote access. And since the end of 2021, we've released over 150,000 images of vital records, which is those births, marriages, and deaths that are the bread and butter um, that you're gonna get to hear about. So at this point, I'm gonna transition to Rich Height who is our state records coordinator, um, as Allison mentioned, and in my humble opinion, uh, quite an expert genealogist, and he's gonna go through the rest of today's topic with you. Rich? Okay, thank you, Ashley. Okay, in my opinion, there are two primary building blocks for reconstructing family lineages for the 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. One is vital records, that is records of births, marriages, and deaths. The other is census records. The Rhode Island State Archives has both, and they are the most useful records for genealogists when they are in the stage of trying to trace lineages back further than they already have them. Vital records could be called the cornerstone of genealogical research. They are the sources genealogists most often turn to first to trace families back for more generations than they already know. And when they are available, they provide the most useful information for that purpose. 
Rhode Island began requiring the statewide recording of births, marriages, and deaths in 1853. That does not mean they are 100% complete. Recording them was required by law, but there was little means to enforce it, especially for those living in isolated areas. The State Archives has the earliest of these records. Currently, the Archives has the state's birth records from 1853 until 1921, marriage records from 1853 through 1921, and death records from 1853 until 1971. These records are all initially filed in the Vital Records Office of the Department of Health. For privacy reasons, birth and marriage records remain at the Department of Health for 100 years after the event, and death records stay there for 50 years. After those lapses of time, the records are turned over to the State Archives. From 1853 until the summer of 1921, these records were maintained in ledger books. Beginning in July 1921, individual certificates were issued for each of these events. We have individual death certificates for deaths in Rhode Island from the summer of 1921 through 1971. And we also have now individual birth and marriage certificates for the latter half of 1921. Now, in most situations, the obvious first place to look is a birth record. For example, if you're looking for an ancestor born in 1859 in Rhode Island, you will want to look at 1859 birth records. Not sure of which town this ancestor was born in? That's no problem. We have statewide indexes. The earliest of these statewide birth records are going to give the name of the child, the date of birth, the names of the parents, race, and the occupation of the father. That early, it was assumed that mothers would be housekeepers with no job that earned income, and also the birthplace of each parent. In some instances, the maiden name of the mother might be given and that became more frequent as time went on. And through the years, the birth records got more detailed. Eventually, they gave information such as the age of each parent and the number of children the mother had previously given birth to. I can't state a specific year for this because there were variations from town to town. Our marriage records are equally informative. From the very beginning in 1853, they give the date of marriage, the names and ages of the bride and groom, the place of residence and birthplace of each one, race, the occupation of the groom, and the names of the parents of both parties. If one gets lucky, the maiden name of a mother might be included. And for people born in Rhode Island in the 1830s and 1840s, these are the most obvious records to use to identify their parents, because while they may have been born too early to have their births recorded, a marriage record will give that information. People are generally going to know the names of their own parents, so these are pretty reliable sources of that information. And occasionally, there can be a glitch. For example, someone whose mother died in childbirth and whose father remarried within a year or two might name his or her stepmother here, because the stepmother might be the only mother the person ever knew. Checking marriage records for siblings of the bride of gro or groom, if you have that information, is a good idea for comparative purposes. Three or four records giving the same parents' names are always better than one. Now, for people born earlier in the 19th century, or in the last quarter of the 18th century and died after 1853, a death record may be the only vital record in existence. Death records give the date and place of death and the age. And in some cases, the age may be down to the day. As an example, 80 years, four months and 17 days. And if it's that specific, it would allow one to calculate the exact date of birth. 
They also give the occupation of the deceased, although the earliest records will specify if the person is a male above the age of 15, and of course, race. The cause of death is given, and there is a slot that asks for the names of the parents. There is no certainty that slot will be filled, though, and the information on that is only as good as the knowledge of the person who provided it. Now, this does not mean it is wrong. It's part of what I refer to as written oral history. That is, writ history that is written solely on what people remember from the past. Now, if the decedent had a living spouse, that person is a likely candidate to have provided the parents' names. But if not, a child of the deceased is more likely. In any case, if the names of the parents are given, no one should take it for granted that the names are correct, especially if the maiden name of the mother is included. In many cases, the earliest death records only give the name of the deceased person's father anyway. And again, if one knows the names of any siblings of the deceased, it's a good idea to check those also. Ultimately, one may need to check probate records in towns to provide the names of parents of people born and married prior to 1853. But the clues given in the death records when they are there should never be ignored. Now, while no statewide source, while no source of statewide vital records exists prior to 1853, there are some available. James N. Arnold, who was editor of the Narragansett Historical Register, compiled and published what he could extract from town records in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Some of these records date as far back as 1636, when the colony was established, but they are sporadic at best. Our reference archivist, Ken Carlson, has estimated that about 15% of the marriages that took place in the colony and later the state were recorded prior to 1853. About 10% of births and no more than two to 3% of deaths. When they were recorded, they rarely included as much information as the later records. For example, marriage and death records were unlikely to note the names of the parents of those involved. These records could be extracted from town meeting records, town council records, or land evidence. There were also towns that kept vital records before the state mandated it. The ones in town council records could have been created when a resident of a particular town simply decided to enter the name of his family there. He might have brought his Bible to a town meeting and entered the names of himself, his wife, and the names of all of his children, along with the birth dates. And the archives has copies on microfilm of nearly all of the records that Arnold cites in these publications, along with the publications themselves. There are a few exceptions. The records from New Shoreham aren't here, and there are also three volumes of records from the town of Warwick that are missing. Arnold also lists births, marriages, and deaths that were mentioned in newspapers. And the archives does not have copies of newspapers in its collections, but we do have Arnold's volumes that cite those entries. While vital records document specific individuals at the time of major events in their lives, census records can reconstruct complete households. At various moments in time, Government entities compile census records for the purpose of documenting the populations under their jurisdictions. These listings of complete households often provide in just one record information that it would take 10 or more vital records to compile. Now, the state archives has census records dating from the colonial period microfilm copies of the surviving federal census records for the state of Rhode Island from 1790 through 1930, and the existing census records compiled by the state. The earliest colony census record is from 1774, 
And then there is a military census from 1777 that lists only men of the appropriate age to bear arms. And then there is also a state census from 1782. After that, the state did not compile a census again until 1865, and it was continued after that every 10 years until 1935, notably in the years that fell halfway between federal census years. The census records prior to 1850, colony, state, and federal, only list household heads by name. They then break spouses and children down by age categories, and they got more specific as time went on. But the 1790 federal census only listed the number of males of age 16 and above in the household, the number of males under, six to, under 16, and the number of females with no age breakdown. But by 1840, they were breaking children down into groups of under five, of five but under 10, of 10 but under 15, and of 15 and under 20. For adults, it was broken up into 10-year increments from of 20 and under 30 up to of 90 and under 100. And then there was also a category of 100 and above. The 1850 federal census was the first one to name every person in the household. And that being the case, this census makes it possible to trace most families back a couple of days or decades earlier than the statewide vital records can. Because in most cases, children 15 and younger were still living with their parents. And in a large number of instances, people in their early 20s who were still unmarried continued to live in home. So in the 1850 census, one might find people born as early as the 1820s still living in their parents' household. This census gave the name of each individual, the age, and place of birth, no more specific than the state if born in the United States and the country if born outside the United States. Then as time went on, Census takers began asking for more information. Starting in 1880, they asked for the relationship of every person in the household to the head of the household. The husband, if living, would be listed as the household head. If not, the widow would be listed. The wife would be listed as the wife of the household head, and each of the children would be listed as a son or daughter. In some cases, an elderly parent of the husband or wife might be there and listed as father, mother, father-in-law, or mother-in-law. There could be brothers or sisters of the household head, nieces or nephews, or unrelated people who might be listed as servants or boarders. Now, this continued for every census through 1930. Another piece of information that began to be included in 1880 was the birthplaces of the parents of each person listed, state or country. Now, this is another piece of information that has to be classified as written oral history, because one cannot assume that everyone knew precisely where their parents were born, and there's always the chance that the person who provided the information was not the individual cited in the record. Beginning in 1900, census takers began noting the year of arrival in the United States for foreign-born residents. Whether or not the person was a naturalized citizen, which would be denoted by N-A, an alien, which was denoted by A-L, or who had filed citizenship papers, but the process was still ongoing, and that was noted, denoted by P-A. In 1910, People were asked if they spoke English or not, and if not, what language they did speak. In 1920, immigrants were asked what their mother tongue was, even if they spoke English by that time. The children of immigrants were asked the mother tongue of their parents. Okay, then the first of the state censuses in Rhode Island to list every member of the household was 1865. 
Now, these censuses are sporadic in how useful they are to genealogists. The 1865 and 1875 censuses list every member of the household in much the same fashion as the federal census records. For individuals born in Rhode Island, they include a specific piece of information that the federal records do not. They give the town the person was born in. Now, the 1885 census is not nearly so useful because it doesn't organize people by household. 1895 exists only for Providence. The 1905 census includes cards for each individual listed and gives an address. Women are listed separately from men, so to reconstruct an entire household, one must look through every one of a particular surname and note the ones at the same address as the specific individual being searched for. 1915 and 1925 are more conventional. They list every member of the household and also note whether foreign born residents are naturalized. And 1935 is similar to 1905. The State Archives also has a collection of published city and town directories from all over the state, but it's far from complete. Some are on microfilm and some are actual printed copies. The earliest one that the archives has is an 1824 directory of Providence. Actual relationship information in these records is limited, but looking for others with the same surname can lead researchers to hints about connections. Following a family in directories over a period of several years can also show how long they lived at a specific address or in a particular town. Usually the only name listed is the household head, whose name is given with a street address and usually his occupation. In some cases, if the household head is a man, his wife's name may be given in parentheses. For example, if we had a town directory for Quahog, Rhode Island, and Peter Griffin was listed, the name Lois might be listed in parentheses after his, indicating that she was his wife. It should also give his occupation, which was which is brewery shipping clerk. Now, if the household head is a widow, the name of her deceased husband is often given. Again, from a Quahog town directory, Lois Griffin, widow of Peter. But there are other clues that can be found. For instance, people in their late teens and early 20s who still live with their parents and have jobs might be listed separately, but in their same, but at the same address. For example, the aforementioned Lois Griffin might have been listed alone for several years at 31 Spooner Avenue in Quahog. But then a year might come that lists another individual, Stewie Griffin, occupation motivational speaker who boards at 31 Spooner Avenue. When seeing that, one can conclude that Stewie Griffin is probably a son of the widow Lois Griffin, and so obviously also of her late husband, Peter Griffin. But researchers should also check other records to verify this, of course, such as vital records and cen census records, but this is an important clue. Okay, now coming to military records. Generally, military records provide very little information on intergenerational relationships, although there are a few Civil War records that do. However, they document a part of ancestors' lives that descendants are also very interested in, and for that reason, they are some of our most heavily utilized sources. They are a necessity for researchers interested in hereditary societies, such as the Daughters of the American Revolution. I'm going to mention a few, few highlights of the uh, State Archive sources here. There are no fewer than 19 volumes from the years of the Revolutionary War and immediately after that document the service of Rhode Islanders in the Continental Army during that time or in local militia units. The reference archivist, Ken Carlson, has compiled a detailed name index of these volumes. 
In most cases, they are just rosters that say no more about a soldier or militia member than his name and rank. For militia members, the list itself will usually note place of residence. Well, Civil War records are generally more detailed, and there are certain ones that will give information on family relationships. Soldiers who were under the age of 21 had to have the signed consent of a parent or guardian in order to enlist, and the relationship is usually noted. It's usually the father, but it could be the mother or even a grandfather if the father was deceased. Regimental rosters typically give name, age, and physical description, such as height, hair color, and eye color, place of birth, and occupation. The archives has rosters of each regiment with the names in alphabetical order. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough to have an ancestor who served in the 11th Rhode Island Regiment, the archives has a unique source. In 1863, a genealogist took the trouble of preparing a roster of the regiment that listed each soldier's wife and children by name, parents, and even grandparents when the information could be obtained. So the descendants of troops of this regiment have a gold mine at their disposal, and the archives has this volume on microfilm. For Rhode Islanders who served in World War I, the archives have service cards. They give the enlistee's name, age at the time of enlistment, date of enlistment, address, and some details about the person's service. The records are separated by branch of the service. As an example, I recall the card of a sailor named George A. Bailey, who was a resident of Newport and served in the Navy. He was 29 years old when he enlisted in 1917, which means he was born about 1887 or 1888. The card indicates that he, was, he served on the ship USS Cyclops, and it notes that the ship was lost on June 14, 1918. And that date is also given as this sailor's date of death. Now, in reality, no one knows what really happened to this ship. The date given is the last known contact or sighting of it, as it vanished somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle. For more recent wars, such as World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, military records at the archives are sparse. I would suggest contacting the reference archivist before coming in to research veterans of those wars to figure out if there's enough information to make it worthwhile. Naturalizations and other records relating to immigration are among the most useful for genealogists, especially for researchers whose ancestors arrived in this country since the late 19th century. The State Archives does not have any actual naturalization records. For those records, passenger lists, and ports of entry records, the best place to go is the New England Regions branch of the National Archives, which is located in Waltham, Massachusetts. The State Archives does have microfilm copies of immigration cards dating from the mid-19th to the early 20th century. These give name, address, petition or certificate number, location of court in which it was administered, country of birth, year of birth, the date and port of arrival in the United States, date of naturalization, and the names and addresses of witnesses. These original records can be found at the Supreme Court Judicial Records Center in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now there are also some towns in Rhode Island that have records that give evidence of naturalization. And the State Archives has microfilm copies of those records. For example, Pawtucket has a card index of naturalized persons from the 19th and 20th centuries who died in the town. Providence has voter cards for naturalized citizens from the 1920s to the 1950s. Westerly has a list of naturalized citizens through 1925. Aside from that, as I already mentioned, U.S. Census records from 1900 on include information on year of arrival and whether or not someone was naturalized. 
Records like these give useful information to follow up on to look for an a actual naturalization record in other locations. Some also provide information on family connections. For instance, if um, someone whose father has already been naturalized goes through the process, that fact, along with the name of the father, will be included on some records. Now, I want to move on to some potential traps that beginning researchers often fall into. This slide with a well-known scene from the movie The Godfather Part Two illustrates one widespread legend that genealogists often believe. The idea that surnames were changed at Ellis Island. In this scene, the young Vito Andalini has just arrived at Ellis Island and cannot understand what the immigration agent is asking him. Another employee reads Vito's papers and tells the agent, Vito Andalini from Corleone. The agent then repeats, Corleone, Vito Corleone, and writes that down. Presto, Vito Andalini's name is now Vito Corleone. But this is an entirely fictionalized depiction. These agencies, agents had the ship's manifests in front of them. Different interpreters who spoke every language that might be found on the ship that had just come in were on hand to help the immigrants speak to these registration officials. These officials did not write anything. When the young Vito Andalini came before the official here, an Italian speaking interpreter, would have translated the agent's questions and help him find Vito Andalini's name in the manifest. All the agent would have done would have been to have checked off his name. He would not have written him down as Vito Corleone. Now, if his name later became Vito Corleone, in honor of the town he was from in Sicily, it would have been because he chose to change it himself. And that was a step a lot of immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century took. One example of that is a Croatian immigrant named Ivan Bilicic, originally spelled B-I-L-I-C-I-C, -I -I who arrived in 1897. Well, soon after arrival, he anglicized his name. Ivan became John, which is its English equivalent. The spelling of Belichick was changed so that it would look more like it was pronounced in English. And in case any of you are wondering, this immigrant, originally Ivan Belichick, is, is the grandfather of the coach of the New England Patriots. Now, everyone who starts on genealogy is advised to talk to older family members and find out what they know. And this is definitely sound advice but one also has to bear in mind that it is necessary to verify what these family members tell, not just to take it for granted that everything is told is exactly right and built on it. What members of previous generations of our family tell us is what is called oral history. And oral history is not documented history. That doesn't mean it's always wrong, and in fact, much of it is accurate but to assume that it is always accurate is a mistake. If not verified, it can lead to years of frustration trying to prove a lineage with a starting point that was not correct in the first place. Even with primary sources, errors that are transmitted orally can creep in. Certain types of records are more prone to error than others because of the types of information they ask for. For example, I already talked about the fact that beginning in 1880, the census asked for birthplaces of the parents of each individual listed. Now, one cannot take it for granted that everyone knows that information about his or her parents. I have seen numerous cases in which the responses to this question vary from one census to the other for the same person. One can never know exactly who provided the census takers with the information either. There were undoubtedly cases when census takers arrived at a household when parents were away. In these cases, teenagers or children even younger might have been the ones who answered the questions. And this would involve asking these children not only where their parents were born, 
but also their grandparents on behalf of their parents. There is certainly no guarantee these answers are correct. Another type of record that lists where parents of an individual born was a death certificate. In those cases, the decedent himself or herself is obviously not providing the information. Usually the informant will be a spouse or child of the deceased in the case of an adult. In most cases, these birthplaces are probably correct, but no researcher should ever take that for granted. Multiple sources should be checked to verify the information found on death certificates. Death certificates also list the names of parents of the deceased. Again, however, this information is only as good as the knowledge of the person who provided it. As previously noted, a child of the deceased often acts as the informant. Most people know the names of their grandparents, but there is room for error, particularly when it comes to the maiden names of grandmothers. For instance, I was once searching for the names of the parents of one of my great-great-grandmothers, whose maiden name was Mary Etta Bowling. She died in North Carolina in 1889, which was before death records were created in that state. I had learned, however, that she'd had a brother named Charles Bowling who outlived her by 60 years. When I obtained his death certificate, it gave his parents' names as William Bowling and Sarah Angel, and I initially assumed that I had the correct names of another generation. Eventually, though, I found the family in the 1870 census. William was the correct name of the father, but the name of his wife was given as Elizabeth rather than Sarah. Mary Etta and Charles, both born in the 1850s, were in the household at that time, and I initially thought that their mother, Sarah Angel, had died and that Elizabeth was their stepmother. But then I located a marriage record of William Bowling and Elizabeth Martin in 1846. Well, it was obvious. Elizabeth Martin was their mother, not Sarah Angel. For a long time, I had no idea where the name Sarah Angel came from. And I still have no answer for the first name Sarah, but I now know that the maiden name of Charles Bowling's mother-in-law, who was not related to me, was Angel. Somebody apparently had assigned the surname of Angel to the wrong grandmother. But had I taken the death certificate for granted, I might still be looking for a non-existent ancestor named Sarah Angel. There are other situations, though, when inaccurate birthplaces or names recorded on documents such as these mean something. Seven years after starting my genealogy research, I definitively traced my, male line, uh, my direct male lineage to a Revolutionary War soldier named Christopher Height, who lived in Bedford County, Pennsylvania. I was excited to find the grave of a daughter of his who had lived until 1886. That was key because 1880 was the first U.S. census that listed the birthplace of parents, and none of Christopher's other children had, as far as I knew, lived that long. I was pretty sure that Christopher had been born in Pennsylvania, but I wanted evidence for that. But when I looked this daughter up on the 1880 census, the birthplace of her father was not given as Pennsylvania. Instead, it was given as Baden. Well, Baden, at the time, was the southwesternmost of the German states, and I was already pretty sure the family was of German origin. But the idea that Christopher himself had been born there really didn't make much sense. The man that I was pretty sure was his father had arrived in the country in 1751, and Christopher himself was not born until about 1759. I also knew that immigration to the American colonies had almost entirely ceased from 1756 to 1763 because of the Seven Years' War, and I had evidence that the family had probably been in that part of Pennsylvania by the beginning of 1763. But, you know, I thought maybe Baden had something to do with the family's background. I started checking the Mormon Church's International Genealogical Index with, um, for families with the German spelling of my surname in Baden. 
found a few possibilities, but I eventually focused on the village of Grotzingen, which is about 50 kilometers south of the city of Heidelberg. The family there used a lot of the same given names that the first couple of generations of my family in this country had used. Well, then more than a decade later, when Y-chromosome DNA testing became widely available, I located a man with a provable lineage to the Height family in that village. Our Y-chromosomes matched, which proved we have a common male line ancestor. And I have now been to this village on six separate occasions and have become good friends with some distant relatives who live there. Now, even though Baden was not Christopher Height's birthplace, it was the birthplace of his father. And I might never have found that without the inaccurate entry about Christopher's birthplace in the 1880 census. So that's the only record I've found in this country that pinpoints a specific German state as my ancestral home. Now, while this example and the example of the inaccurate name of Charles Bowling's mother on his death certificate show that it's necessary to verify all sources as much as possible with others. Certain information on specific types of records is particularly vulnerable to error, such as parents' names and birthplaces on death certificates and parents' birthplaces on census records. But even when these items turn out to be incorrect for the specific person involved, one must consider the possibility that they reflect something that's true. Charles Bowling's mother's maiden name was not Sarah Angel. But his mother-in-law's name was Angel, so even though that surname has nothing to do with my lineage, it does figure into the, inact uh, the ancestry of his death certificate, his direct descendants. Christopher Height was not born in Baden, but his father, the grandfather of the person on this 1880 census, was. And learning that enabled me to locate ancestors in a specific village there. We are hoping, of course, that some of you will eventually come in to utilize our resources. That being the case, we're going to give you a few tips for preservation of the materials you may review. Some of our records are quite old and must be handled carefully. Some of our collections are on the shelves and can be accessed directly by researchers. One thing to avoid when taking books off the shelves is by pulling them by the head cap that is the top of the binding. This will eventually tear the binding and the damage will worsen over time. It's better to pull a book somewhere in the middle. If a book has been shoved in too far to grab it by the middle, I would suggest pulling out an adjoining book, again, not by the head cap, to free space to get a hold of the book you want. Now, when researching loose items, which will usually be in folders, Materials should be kept flat on the table, and they should also be left in original order. They should be moved deliberately and with care to avoid damaging them, because some are a bit fragile. Also, researchers should try to handle only blank areas of pages. And this is also true for bound materials that are brought into the reading room from the vault. In the case of these bound volumes, Support should be used for the bindings when available, and reading room staff can provide items for this purpose. Finally, no pens should be used to take notes in the reading room. Only pencils can be used for that purpose. The reading room staff can provide pencils for researchers who don't have them. No food or drink are permitted in the research area. And as a security measure, Researchers will ask to be checked any and all bags they bring with them, including, purpose, including purses, and we have lockers for this purpose. Patrons are allowed to use their own laptops, notebooks, and other papers in the reading room. All right. Thank you, Rich. That was fantastic. Thank you for walking through all of the really deep and in the weeds pieces of this presentation and sharing with our participants how to deep dive into the records at the State Archives.